So, hi everyone. Uh, I guess good afternoon and good morning, good evening. I guess depends, you know, where everyone is uh, is based. Um, just before I, I get into the the presentation, uh, I you know had a good opportunity to look at some of the the other presentations, you know, today and yesterday. Um, I think there's been some pretty fantastic, you know, talks and discussions going on. Um, I think, you know, one thing to, to say, and I'm sure a lot of people will agree, you know, the, the guys at Speckle have done a great job putting on this event. Um, you know, these things don't come together easily. So, you know, first of all, kudos to them and you know, thanks for kind of inviting me to speak as well. Um, at the beginning of this year, you know, 2021, uh, we began to develop the concept of what we now call Cope, our product Cope. Uh, in April, we took on a bit of investment to focus on this product. Um, and I kind of have to, you know, sometimes remind myself that it's been less than six months of, you know, actual focus that we've put into this product. Um, you know, the team, that my team have done an amazing job getting it to where it is now. Uh, and I'm pretty excited to, you know, show you guys what we've been up to. Uh, this is actually the first time we've really spoken about COPE or shown anything publicly about what we're building, you know, certainly outside of investment pitches and, you know, our current users. Um, so really kind of excited to, to go through that with you. Uh, for this presentation, I'll give you a bit of a, a high level overview of some of the origins of COPE, you know, where it started from. Uh, and I'll show you some snippets and some teasers of the product itself as well. Um, it's not going to be a super long presentation. Uh, you know, there'll be plenty of time for questions and discussions at the end too when we get into that. So hopefully everyone sticks around for that. Uh, let me just make sure my mouse is working. There we go. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Mark Foley, as Alan said. I'm one of three co-founders at Matalab. Uh, I come from a, an architectural background, uh, but I moved into technology and software fairly early on in my career, uh, working in you know, technical roles at companies such as Acom and Grimshaw. I was particularly leading kind of the computational departments there. Uh, some of you may also know I originally founded a computational design consultancy after you know I, after I left Grimshaw. Uh, that was called Design Tech. Uh, that was acquired, and Matalab is now kind of our, our second venture, our second baby, if you like. Uh, at Matalab, I act as our CEO, so looking after things from finance and profitability to company strategy and business growth. So I've kind of moved away from some of the, the technical stuff that some of the team do now, which is a bit of a shame to, to a certain degree, but you know, much smarter people around me now, which is uh, good. Uh, you know, my details are on the screen there. I've got my Twitter handle there and email as well if people want to connect or, or reach out. Uh, so before I jump into Cope, uh, let me just start by giving you guys a, an introduction to Matlab. So Matlab, we're a product and innovation lab. You know, we're made up of technology experts, software developers, designers, architects, engineers. You know, we've got a full roster of, of different people within the team. Uh, the company was formed in 2019, so we're still fairly new, I guess. Um, you know, and the main reason for setting up Matlab was to kind of get back to doing what we enjoy most, so solving complex problems. You know, we're a team of problem solvers after all. So solving, you know, complex problems and challenging things is what we do and what we enjoy doing. Uh, the last two years have been interesting growing a business through COVID. I'm sure a lot of the other presenters and, and a lot of people, you know, dialing in would, uh, you know, have some similar feelings towards the last two years. Uh, but, you know, we've managed to grow. We've managed to build a number of products. We've also managed to do some amazing work for some clients. So it's been pretty good. Um, and, you know, we typically work with a lot of the leading organizations in the industry. So whether they're architects, engineers, general contractors, developers, also do a lot of work with, with Autodesk. Um, but, you know, we're all about developing strategies and software uh, with a particular focus on automation and industrialized construction. And you'll see kind of the industrialized construction piece come out in, in COPE. Why is my mouse not working? There we go. So enough about Matlab, I think just moving on to, you know, the world and what we're all witnessing at the moment. Uh, I just kind of wanted to set the tone a little bit. You know, if anyone reads the news, you know, they'll have seen a general thread appearing across many industries. Um, you know, there's lots of materials in shortages. Think of the computer chips that we're, we're missing, um, right down to, you know, chicken missing from Nando's for those in the UK who might relate to that. Uh, we also had a bit of a fuel crisis here in the UK as well. And, you know, that was primarily driven by a lack of 
uh, or a shortage of lorry drivers. Um, so, you know, we're missing key people in key logistical positions, and that's really having a knock-on effect to the entire supply chain, uh, not just here in the UK, but Europe and obviously the rest of the world as well. So, you know, there's lots of challenging things happening uh, in, in, in society at the moment. And, you know, it's no real different to our industry. You know, th these problems are apparent here too. You know, we have material shortages across the board, you know, from timber to steel to concrete, you know, and all these shortages, they're all driving the price up. You know, as an example, the price of timber, I think I read recently that, you know, the price of timber went up something like 23, 24%. I think between the months of June and July, uh, you know, completely unsustainable, that sort of thing, you know, huge knock on effect to, to construction. We also have a, an aging and undiversified workforce as well. Uh, and I'm sure you've all seen those graphs about the distribution of age across the labor market and the lack of kind of new apprentices joining construction. You know, these are all huge problems that our industry faces and, you know, compound all of those into, you know, the global housing crisis that's going on. Um, you know, here in the UK, we can kind of contribute, you know, some of these things to the likes of Brexit. I won't necessarily get into any opinions on a, or certainly my opinion on the, those political things. But, you know, globally, the pandemic as well is accelerating a lot of these problems. So as a society, I guess, and as an industry, you know, we, we consume too much and we need to be smarter about construction and how construction actually contributes to some of this. So... None of this is new. You know, I'm not necessarily preaching anything that people on this uh, on this webinar won't have heard before. Um, you know, I often revert back to a, a piece that was uh, published here in the UK back in 2016, a report. Uh, and, you know, it outlines a lot of the growing pressure on the construction industry and our need for action and our need for change. And, you know, bear in mind this was put together before the pandemic. So, as I said before, things have only heightened since then. Everyone is aware that there is, you know, low productivity in construction, very low predictability and foresight, and it's also very fragmented in terms of processes and teams. Now, as recently as last week, I believe the same author, so uh, Mark Farmer, who's uh, one of the advisors to the government here in the UK, you know, he was the same author of the, the report that I just had up on screen there. And he was asked to comment uh, as recently as last week on the current climate and, you know, same sort of same sort of stuff coming out of uh, you know what he's thinking about there. Still a lot of kind of pain ahead. You know, we we're, as an industry, you know, we still need to change. So you know, how do we do that, and what do we do to start changing the tide? Well, even with these growing concerns, you know, as an industry, we're still under a lot of pressure to build more. Our population is growing. You know, there's no sign of that necessarily slowing down. So globally, you know, there's been a lot of interest around the concept of industrialized construction. And, you know, this has been promoted as a way of achieving more without necessarily using more. So really looking at, you know, the supply chain, looking at labor markets, productivity, I see is seen as a way of solving those things. Now, you know, whilst these principles of industrialized construction aren't necessarily a new thing, in the States and particularly here in the UK, the drive to offsite construction is being driven quite aggressively, I guess, by government strategy and well funded institutional customers. So, you know, there's a real push towards IC at the moment. So, just a quick one for those who aren't familiar, I guess, with industrialized construction and the terminology or unsure what it necessarily means, you know, it simply just centers around the use of offsite construction techniques. So think of principles common in manufacturing, such as factory conditions, mass production. You know, it's about bringing those principles into construction. So the main aim with IC is to reduce, you know, or remove arguably some of the manual labor common in projects by assembling components offsite rather than at the point of installation. So particularly here in the UK, we often use different terms to describe industrialized construction. Uh, people on the call might be familiar with MMC, so Modern Methods of Construction or DFMA, uh, Design for Manufacturing Assembly. You know, there might be people here that disagree, but realistically, they're all in essence, they all in essence mean the same thing. You know, they all encompass different construction methods, and at the same time, they all refer to the convergence of construction and manufacturing coming together. 
So I read a, an interesting fact uh, the other, uh, well, it was a while ago actually, but you know, I think it's it is, it's still quite kind of interesting to, to to dive into it a little bit. You know, it's been projected that by 2035, you know, the majority of buildings constructed globally will be constructed using industrialized construction methods. You know, kind of seems slightly unbelievable considering where we are at the moment, but. I kind of feel as a, an industry, you know, we need, you know, a, a push into another direction to ensure the industry doesn't begin to stagnate. And, you know, some of those challenges that we saw earlier aren't actually facing us moving forward. Um, I see obviously promises to carry a lot of benefits across the board. You know, the biggest steps will be made through increasing labor productivity, um, replacing you know some very labor intensive processes with machinery so bringing in automation improving cost and quality making construction safer as well which is you know vital and you know you don't need to take my word on this you know there's lots a lot more smarter people uh, you know including people at mckinsey who've kind of come to the same conclusion around ic so um i think it's really going to be something that moves our industry forward over the next you know five to ten years you know however all these benefits of IC, you know, with that said, you know, our experience and the work that we've done in the space it still tells us that there's a lot of challenges ahead for those organizations looking to adopt uh, industrialized construction principles. Uh, take production as an example. Um, you know, the amount of production content, whether that be drawings, uh, you know, machining files, information for fabrication, you know, all of that production content that's required for off-site processes is significantly higher than when it's when you're doing kind of traditional on-site construction. Um, so to give you an example, you know, a typical three-bedroom house built using traditional on-site construction processes, less than 50 drawings, you know, would be common. You know, we can build a, a typical house there with with, with very few uh, bits of information. For the same house built using off-site processes, so building you know a, a three-bedroom house in a factory, you know, that number of drawings multiplies significantly you know hundredfold up to five thousand you know it's, it's hugely significant so you know you think of the man hours and the resources needed to create that level of content that's going to slow down the entire process it's going to cost organizations considerably more to produce so you know these challenges that i see solve on one hand you know it then presents other challenges elsewhere uh, another example would be variation so you know the inclusion of industrialized construction processes you know they're often kind of an afterthought in projects you know certainly in design uh, and you know opportunities are only typically then found later in a project when materials are specified so you'll see lots of people talking about the way to solve industrialized construction problems is to bring you know manufacturers and uh, you know the supply chain earlier on into the design process which you know is possible uh, but you know we're, we're kind of lacking uh, you know, visibility and, um, and foresight to actually do that. Um, also on kind of variation, you know, if you, uh, in certain cases where projects um, have been uh, designed in a way that where, you know, industrialized construction has been considered from the, from the, from the get-go, um, you know, any variation or change required, you know, further down the line can have, again, huge knock-on effects when you consider you know the the issues with pr production content and you know any er errors that occur through that can have a huge kind of knock-on effect when you get onto the factory floor you know and end up costing you know companies lots of money um in terms of kind of visibility you know construction businesses they deal with a huge amount of paper manual processes you know they're extremely kind of labor intensive and time consuming to manage um so you know i think over you know, the last 20, 30 years, there's been a huge kind of disconnect between design and build teams and the supply team. And, and you know, the, that challenge has been facing the construction industry for, for a long time. Um, and because of that, there's kind of a lack of visibility on what the supply chain can offer through industrialized construction early enough in the project to allow it for its inclusion. So, like I said, even with all the benefits of IC, lots of challenges still present themselves. So with those challenges in mind, you know, we've been lucky enough over the last two years to work with some really kind of forward thinking companies trying to overhaul 
existing processes, you know, from design builders to offsite contractors to manufacturers. You know, one of those companies in particular that we've done a fair bit of work with was a company called Ilka Homes, based in the north of England. Uh, Ilka, uh, you know, one of the leading modular house builders here in the UK, um, had lots of investment, you know, doing extremely well. Um, so I'd like to kind of just take a few moments to talk about our journey and learnings together and how that led to the origins of COPE. Just play a little video here. Oops. Why is that not playing? There we go. I'll just let that video play in the background and I'll kind of run through in a little bit more detail. So, you know, our, our team at MathLab, you know, we've always been obsessed with automation and understanding rules and construction. Um, so I think when we initially engaged with Ilka, you know, we went into those meetings fairly confident about what we were going to do and what we were going to achieve. But, you know, what we didn't really appreciate was just how complex it is to build a home in a factory. Um, you know, the amount of kind of quality control that's required, you know, we'd never seen kind of levels uh, like that before. So compared to the traditional processes that we were used to, you know, the main difference for us was that level of precision and the depth of information needed for each house and in each turn, each, you know, house module. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, we were used to getting a great outcome designing homes with fewer than 50 drawings. For a modular home, you know, that doesn't even cover the plasterboard. So, you know, the amount of information and detail that you need to go into is, is far greater. You know, everything needs to be articulated. You know, any loose tolerances that you may come across on a building site, you know, a typical building site, you know, they need to be completely removed from the process. You know, there's no, you know, we can just shift it this way or just shift it that way. That's not how it works in, in a factory. So what we saw when we began to work with Ilka was a huge amount of content describing everything in fine detail. So one big driver for Ilka when we you know, sat down with them was all about the throughput through their factory. You know, they want to produce as many homes as they can, as many completed homes as they can through their factory. So you know, going from two homes a day to six to eight to ten. Um, and you know, that's probably not possible without software and technology playing a, a big part of that. So very early on when we sat down with their management team, you know, they were keen for us to look and, you know, hopefully improve their kind of existing process, uh, all with the aim of hoping to, you know, give them greater scalability and capacity in the long run. So what we began to do is what we do best as a team. You know, we began to look at their process and encode it, you know, turn it into, turn it into code. Their existing design to manufacturing process, it followed a series of interdependent steps that we were able to define rules for. The starting place was a steel frame. So that's kind of what their modules are based on. Uh, and then all the components were to be placed based on the architectural design and the services following that steel frame. So, you know, if a decision or a change was made at any point in that process, all of the corresponding elements further down the chain needed to kind of resolve themselves automatically based on that. And it was only by doing that and allowing, you know, those uh, relationships where we were able to actually build something uh, pretty cool. So to enable this, we took a systems based approach. Um, you know, how could we describe a generic wall drawn in Revit and turn it into its component parts required for construction? You know, many people think the, and I hear this a lot, you know, many people think the path to industrialized construction is through developing a library of content, you know, through this kind of kit of parts approach. Uh, we saw things a little bit differently to that. You know, instead of building geometric content, you know, what if we could describe a system by the rules, by the constraints it needed to follow, along with interfaces and relationships, to adjacent and dependent systems. You know, we could probably approach this slightly differently. So, you know, this wasn't just a case of subdividing surfaces. You know, there's a huge amount of rules that need to be followed, you know, different edge cases, which require different levels of treatment. So, you know, multiply that complexity by all the panels, all the fixing points, openings, patricing panel, uh, patterns, you know, insulation, and so on and so on, you know, and that's just one module. Then consider that that module then connects to another module. You know, you might have one above it if, you know, it's a two-story house. Um, you know, before you know it, you've got this huge interlocking web of 
rules. Um, so by the end of the project, what we had done was we'd encoded, you know, an entire, we kind of referred to it as an entire design to manufacturing process. It took a baseline Revit design model, you know, one that you would typically see in stage two or three and aligned it to processes on the factory floor. So we'd in essence created what was a digital representation of a complete module, you know, every bit of plasterboard, every bit of OSB panels, insulation again, fixing, you know, across all walls, ceilings and floors, all done kind of automatically, which was pretty cool to see. So, you know, that was one portion of the work, you know, once that geometry was automated and coming back to those earlier challenges with IC, the next part was tackling the production content. So, you know, whilst we, and I, I'm definitely one of these people, we all dream of a world without drawings, you know, the reality is we're probably still a long way away from that, you know, regardless of whether we ever actually make it in, in the first place. You know, drawings or, you know, the way we see them internally, you know, visual representations of content, you know, they should be driven by what they're articulating and not the other way around. So a team on the factory floor in an Ilka or, you know, in another house building, you know, they, the team, they, they read instructions, whether it be on paper or on screen, but they need to understand that and consume that information in a consistent way. So by working with Ilka and, you know, a few other partners, what we were able to do is take a bit more of a practical approach to, you know, some of these uh, production content. So whether that be schedules or drawings, you know, no unnecessary information, clean and concise information, each sheet performing a singular task. Um, you know, for us, the biggest challenge was that no company does drawings exactly the same as another. You know, that's a, a common thread. You know, each person, each company, they've all got their own tool set. They've all got their own process and opinion and idea of what's good and what's bad. So what we tried to do was focus on the common parts. You know, we wanted to know how do we produce a wide variety of drawings instantly and ensure that they have a clear fixed purpose. So, you know, as long as the drawing is legible and as long as it delivers the information that is required, you know, nuances around, you know, use this font or this dimension needs to sit here instead of over here, you know, that shouldn't be a deciding factor over automation. Uh, and that's kind of, you know, one of the messages that we're, we're, we're kind of pushing on some of our clients. You know, everything you see on screen here has been completely automated, you know, not any human intervention at all so dimensions uh tags everything so um so you know that was the production piece of it or certainly the production content of it and you know this year in june we were uh you know we kind of were able to celebrate a bit bit of a milestone because we had uh modules that were not only designed but also documented entirely from the software and the process that we've built they were actually built on the factory floor. So, you know, our software was actually driving some of these machinery, you know, the high speed panel lines and such. So, you know, kind of cool to actually see that all come together, really. And, you know, whilst the work we did with Ilka is centralized around, you know, their internal expertise and the quality of modular construction that they have, you know, it became very clear that aspects of what we built could be developed in a, a wider initiative and hopefully applied to you know any offsite construction method. So you know what if we could apply the same logic and same foundational technology to other offsite processes? You know make them a bit more agnostic. You know what if we could take the desktop solution that we built for Ilka and move it to the cloud? Uh, and that was really you know it was these questions and and, and discussions that pushed us to you know move towards cope and you know this was the kind of the beginnings of cope so you know at its core what we hope cope it allows is for you know more companies in the construction industry to benefit from that same level of precision and that same level of automation we were able to replicate at ilka um, you know what we're building arguably is a platform that allows for the application of systems and products from the supply chain apply them to your design files and that will give you extensive clarity to decision making at earlier points, you know, when testing ideas and testing different systems is less costly and less damaging to the success of a project. You know, test these systems earlier on rather than later on when decisions are cost more. Um, and, you know, like I said, because COPE automatically creates required outputs. 
you know, from drawing files to digital files for machinery, you know, it allows you to adjust those plans to the market and suppliers without timely consume, you know, without time consuming production work. So no more kind of production team, you know, working away producing those drawings and stuff. So with Cope, what we really aim to do is accelerate that adoption of offsite processes. Um, and, you know, we, we really hope that, you know, with Cope, we're able to help construction companies realize industrialized construction. So I'll just run you through a little bit of, you know, where we're at with Cope. Um, you know, when you think about a traditional construction process, you know, decisions are linear and they restrict the possibility of using different systems and construction processes later on. The supply chain and the manufacturers, you know, they aren't brought into the project till later on, at which point, you know, making any changes to design to accommodate this can be, as I said, costly and time consuming. Now, what we plan with COPE, you know, however, is to allow different systems to be tested in instantly. You know, we want to allow a greater collaboration between these different stakeholders uh, and also remove that production team, uh, you know, producing content, you know, remove the dependency that we have on them. Now, what we've learned over, certainly over the last eight to 12 months, you know, is that each company uh, within this space, you know, they all work to their own structure, their own hierarchy. You know, what one company refers to as an element, another calls a component. Um, what one company refers to as a, a unit, you know, another one calls an apartment and so on, you know, and there might be different tiers or, you know, different levels uh, a different number of levels within that hierarchy as well. So it became clear that, you know, one of the things that we needed within COPE or certainly underpinning COPE was a way for companies to define their own schema. So we started off with the idea and the concept of what we call a workspace, a COPE workspace. Uh, so a COPE workspace really is just a container of things, you know, anything, you know, it can be anything a company really determines it to be. You know, whether that be an entire project or a building or simply a module or a component or something completely kind of custom to them. Uh, the super cool thing about workspaces, though, or workspaces in Cope, is that they allow for this kind of interdependent relationship and hierarchy between them. So, you know, this workspace here can be driven by another workspace. And, you know, that's how we kind of get into this mindset of, you know, we have a, an overall building, you know, that building's driven by units, driven by modules, driven by pods and driven by systems. And again, like I say, that hierarchy and system can be defined completely custom to whichever uh, kind of system that the, the uh, company uh, chooses. Um, so those dependencies, you know, they're made possible by our systems driven approach at the core. Um, you know, as the industry moves towards this kind of kit of parts approach to enable more off-site fabrication, what COPE does is it removes the need for large, complex and static libraries of content. So no more need for, you know, large uh, libraries of Revit families. You know, we don't need to represent materials and components and systems in that way. You know, in the past, I feel like we've concentrated far too much on getting manufacturers to create BIM content for items like furniture but why you know what to, to what end what does that actually solve you know if anyone can actually explain why i need a complete 3d uh, fully detailed sofa in my revit model i'd love to hear that so you know let's step away from you know that type of componentry and move more into a systems driven approach so what we're doing to enable that is we're investing quite heavily in developing what we call activities um, and these activities are based around construction and fabrication methods. So when you break things down in this manner, there's only a limited number of ways in which buildings are put together. You know, each activity that we have in COPE, it describes a very small process based on a particular building system, which combined with others can define an entire company's workflow from start to finish, similar to how we did it at Ilka. So, Give you an example, you take a monolithic floor element, you know, that you would potentially find in a software like Archicad or Revit, you know, typically drawn into stage three. Using activities in Cope, you know, you can break that element down into its precast slab components based on, you know, requirements from a manufacturer like mold size and weight. You can then introduce penetrations for services, place anchor elements, fixing points to facade and core elements, and so on and so on. 
And before you know it, you've gone from this kind of low fidelity design model to a very highly detailed construction model. And it's that kind of transition from design to construction is what you know we're trying to tackle with Cope. Um, you know, with this level of content in the future and you know, working closely with manufacturers, what we aim to do is give a bit more or give clearer visibility, I guess, into that supply chain as kind of a, a longer, longer vision. So allowing that level of flexibility uh, of, you know, of chaining uh, activities together into a workflow is our configurator. Um, you know, lots of configurators out there on the market at the moment, you know, very similar to, you know, a lot of kind of other web-based configurators that allows, you know, just a simple interface to configure inputs and allow users to test different outcomes uh, from, you know, whatever inputs they put. Uh, you know, because activities are chained together, the output of one activity can be down, you know, can directly then affect another. So, you know, going back to those precast floor slabs I mentioned a, a moment ago, you know, if the layout of the slabs changes based on the user's inputs, you know, the penetrations, the fixing points, the anchor positions, you know, they should all then change accordingly. So it's about creating this kind of, you know, interlocking web of rules and how these systems, you know, affect one another. You know, this level of variation and flexibility, you know, will hopefully kind of allow for industrialized construction opportunities on projects to be explored, you know, and discovered a lot earlier and hopefully lead to less rework later on as well. Now, another feature that we've built into COPE, and I think we're, you know, the team here is particularly proud uh, of this uh, feature, is our multi-objective optimization engine. Uh, and it's capable of handling hundreds of executions in parallel. So similar to what you may have come across with, you know, tools such as Galapagos and Refinery, but now we've got this capability on the cloud and fully scalable. So we've actually made modifications to the NSGA2 solver um, to allow for kind of multiple objectives. So, you know, whether a company is looking to you know, reduce, I don't know, reduce cost or reduce material waste, you know, whether they're looking to, you know, improve environmental impact or logistics, you know, our engine is capable of returning the optimum solution in that case. So we've done, put a lot of kind of work over the last six months into, into this uh, piece and, you know, we're pretty proud of uh, where we've landed with that. Um, once the optimization engine runs, um, you, you can visually interrogate and compare options to support early decision making. So, you know, we've got a 3D view, we've got a 2D view, um, and, you know, you can use that to inspect information as well as, you know, tiles and tables and graphs. Um, think of it as kind of a, a, you know, a Power BI dashboard, uh, you know, particularly kind of built around information needed to, you know, mitigate risk or, you know, give you kind of cost certainty. And then finally, you know, once a decision is made, so, you know, we've gone through the configurator, we've given it some inputs, we've decided what we're trying to optimize for, we've then got, you know, a couple of different uh, scenarios or options that it's given us, we're then able to, you know, check which ones of those are most suited to our use case. Uh, then we've got kind of our deliverables engine. So, you know, users are then able to automate all of the production content from uh, the, the chosen option. So all drawings, all machining files, you know, all these things automatically created. Um, you know, as we speak, what we're working through at the moment is bringing much of, you know, the desktop capabilities that we had in Hilka uh, to the cloud. Um, and, you know, hopefully in the long term, we'll re remove any reliance on, you know, the typical design software. So, you know, I hear a lot of people talking about, you know, we use Revit because it's fantastic at, you know, producing drawings, which it definitely is. But what if you didn't need to, you know, go into Revit to produce drawings? What if those drawings were, were automatically produced? And that's kind of the, the space that we're, we're looking at at the moment. So, you know, with that said, our overall vision and, you know, in time is to kind of link this directly to the supply chain, fundamentally rethink how, you know, that entire procurement process might work. So really looking at designers, builders and manufacturers and, you know, creating a kind of cohesive marketplace for them to, to work. And... 
I will finish on um, just kind of letting you know where we are at currently with the existing partners. Um, you know, we're in in a process at the moment of looking for you know more people to help within our focus groups and uh, our new partnership pilots that are starting in the new year. So you know, if anyone is interested, you know, if you work for a design and build company, uh, you know, an offsite uh, constructor or a manufacturer. Um, you know, obviously, we'd like to hear from you from for our kind of next phase of, of development. And with that, I think that was the last slide. So, yeah, I will uh, pause there and open the floor for discussions, questions. I'm not actually sure how this uh, next part works. So, um... yeah. Hi, Mark. Uh... Yeah. You should have, uh, I think you have a couple of in the Q&A and in the chat, oh, okay. uh, which is in your right sidebar. Uh, yeah, stop presenting me because if not, you will not be able to, to yeah. see anything. Uh, in the right sidebar, you have like three main tabs, event, my agenda, and session. And in the session tab, there's a chat and a Q&A. Uh, oh, perfect. So you can kind of like scroll through that. OK, so uh, does code produce assembly diagrams instructions? Do you see a future where assembly instructions are provided directly to robotics for drawing free automated assembly? Totally. Um, so the piece of work we, we did with Ilka, um, we produce what they call an XYZ file, you know, all these different machinery and robotics, you know, they all have different formats, different uh, file formats that they take in. Uh, like I said, the one that they were using was a, an XYZ file, and it purely just plots out uh, coordinates on panels for, you know, where to drill holes, where to put fixing points and all these things. So actually, that was one of the things that we produced, and that goes directly to, to, to the machine without kind of any human intervention. And like I said, you know, the, the piece that we, we saw in June there when kind of our stuff went to production, um those machines were then being driven by those xyz files which was quite cool to see so um so yeah definitely that uh in terms of assembly diagrams and instructions um we've not done a huge a lot a huge amount of work uh so far in that space but it's definitely on our roadmap you know we focus more on uh component drawings uh, kind of overall uh ga's and uh, panel drawings as well because you know a lot of the the work we did originally was was panels so um definitely looking to do assemblies in the future um is revit still used in the back end to create the drawings good question uh, at the moment yes so we run everything through design automation for revit um we hope to you know as we scale this up um, and we get more people on board we've got a plan for how we tackle drawings outside of revit um you know in true kind of MVP style, uh, you know, you build around the components that are accessible and easy to do. So at the moment, yeah, you, you know, you can kick off creating drawings from Cope, the, the web app, uh, and that fires off uh, in the background to Forge, and it sends you back a notification once the, the drawings are done. Uh, one thing to note on that is, you know, as a user of Cope, you don't need to have Revit installed, all that happens in the background. You, know, you don't need a license for Revit, so uh, open Cope, kick off your drawings, you get your drawings back. Uh, you, you know, you don't necessarily see what's happened in the background, which is quite cool. Um, do you plan to release an API for genetic optimization on the cloud? <laughs> Good question. And uh, so we're definitely API first. Um, you know, the, the team here, I'm not going to go too technical, but the, you know, the, the team, uh, you know, led by Radio our CTO, they've done a fantastic job ensuring that, you know, everything is kind of api first um will we open something up on the optimization side of things quite possibly um we're in talks with you know a few of the people that have been presenting obviously uh, over the last two days around you know how we can integrate and connect into into their services so yeah you know i i see a world where you know a lot of these systems begin to talk to one another in the long term so um quite possibly who knows I guess uh, one question I would have back to you is um, for what purpose? <laughs> um, yeah, what do you have anything in mind uh, around that in particular? 
um, or just wanting to leverage that optimization piece. Um, let's see if we've got anything in the chat. Uh, so just reading a comment from uh, Mike there, uh, why provide detailed BIM chairs? Clients like to see pretty pictures that they can understand. A chair is a chair, but a nice model chair is definitely a chair which they understand because they sit here every day. <laughs> yep, for sure. Um, you know, I think um, outside of visualization, you know, what level of information uh, is actually needed? Uh, you know, I know the, the guys at Kanoa, I saw a presentation, uh, I've seen a couple of their presentations over, over the while, you know, I think their approach with, you know, 2D and, uh, you know, laid in some database information and product data sheets, I think is a good approach for, for things like furniture. Um, you know, when we get into, you know, the elements and the systems that we're interested in, um, you know, building systems, how do we put this wall together? How do we put this floor together? How do we put this facade together? That's when, you know, you need that level of detail. Um, so that's kind of our, our thought process there. Uh, another question there, can you share lessons learned on your product development, common mistakes made in design that are not suitable for construction? Um, <laughs> how long have you got? <laughs> Um, common mistakes made in design. So lessons learned, particularly around developing a product. Um, you know, we've we've developed a, a lot of products. We've had some successful products. We've had some not some not so successful products. I think you know one one thing that's important is when you know when you build something that you know for whatever reason it doesn't work. Whether that's you know you've built the wrong thing. You know um, you've not necessarily worked out the target market correctly, um, you know, multiple different factors that can come into play here. You know, it's all about understanding, you know, what, what went wrong that time and kind of making sure that that doesn't happen the next time. So I think, you know, the, the biggest lesson that I think we as a team have learned, you know, over, over the, the time we've been building products is, you know, build things in its smallest form as quick as possible, you know, build something quick, get some customers involved, get some feedback, um, learn and kind of evolve the product based on that. You know, it's very easy to make assumptions about what's good and what people need, but, you know, realistically, you know, until someone's actually paying you money for it, you know, then they can say all, all they like, but, you know, until someone actually, you know, contributes financially to, to your product, then, uh, you know, you could, be in, you could be building the wrong thing. Um, any more questions at all? <laughs> Seems maybe not. Yeah, I think we have one last one from Mike Morgan. This came in right now. <laughs> So each building is a prototype, unless there is a mass demand, house building makes sense. Cope does look like it can expand to one-off buildings. I think in the long term, it would expand to one-off buildings. Um, you know, uh, we're doing a, a, a lot of work with a, a couple of GCs, uh, you know, in the States and here in the, in the UK as well. You know, they're typically designing one-off buildings. Um, but even in a one-off building, there can be you know, similarities to something else that they're constructing in their portfolio. Um, so it's about finding opportunities like that. Um, you know, if internal wall panels, you know, internal wall cassettes, you know, no one really cares what a, you know, a, an internal partition looks like. It just needs to perform, you know, based on acoustics. It needs to perform based on fire. Um, you know, so there is some requirements, but, you know, that, that, panel that panel can go in you know building a it can easily go in building b and um, so i think you know when we talk about one-off buildings it's trying to understand actually what's one off in that building you know if, if you speak to ian key or hypo you know he'll talk about this idea of always starting from a, a blank piece of paper and you know it's 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 a common thing that happens in in design 
you know, we're, we're, we've built all these buildings in the past and then we just start from from a blank piece of paper every time we do a new building like that's that's changing and you know you can see that changing a lot and i think with contractors and developers you know they're you know who have a, a greater foresight on you know portfolio level that's where they're interested in saying okay well you know i can order a thousand of these panels and you know 200 of them could go into this building 200 into this building and so on and that's where you know you're going to get um levels of kind of mass uh uh customization and production coming through so um so yeah i think uh in the long term hopefully yeah product products and systems are not one off but repeat exactly like i said before you know the the way we approach things on a system level um you know that system can be applied to any building so precast floor slabs you know we've done a lot of work around that space you know that doesn't matter whether it's a you know a commercial building doesn't matter if it's residential you know you can still use the same uh, off-site construction method and that's kind of what we want to allow for these com companies to test uh, you know on their product on their uh, projects I think that was it on the questions, was it? Yes. No one's got any last ones. There's always one that keeps sneaking in. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to thank you a lot, Mark, for the presentation and the sneak peek on COPE. It's definitely a promising contraption. I'm looking forward to see more uh, of your uh, internal videos and some of the buildings that result out of it, for sure yeah no definitely yeah like i said this was a, a good opportunity to show you guys a, a little bit about what we've been up to and you know the journey um you know over the next six months you'll see a lot more kind of coming out about you know some of the, the work and uh, demos and stuff like that so looking forward to that that should be good awesome congrats for the great uh, platform okay awesome okay guys well, thanks for everyone who joined. And uh, like I said, if uh, if anyone wants to, to, to reach out, you've got my email and uh, Twitter as well. So uh, feel free.